We thank you ever so much for the day that you've given us, for the uh, day of spring, the sunshine, the warmer weather, all that you uh, provide for us that we might have our lives sustained. I would ask this morning, Father, that you would be with us as we go through this class material, that uh, it would be enlightening to all those who are here and those who are listening live stream. And Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I was trying to find some class material for this morning that would be maybe like a one-time class. I know each of you are coming from different branches, and at Center Branch we have one thing, and here you have another, and Blue Springs has another, and so I didn't want to try to confuse everybody by bringing one of those classes or having, I think you get the picture, so therefore I've chosen some material that we hopefully is just kind of like for today. Although I'm sure that the material that is here, and hopefully you all now have that material, uh, is something you could probably study and have a doctoral thesis over very easily. It's a rather large topic. Uh, right, Josh? <laughs> he's had a chance to look at it, so I think that's why he's chuckling over there with it. Back when I was writing the class material for the MIT Missionary and Training Program, and this is, goes back to, I think, 2007 or 8 or somewhere right around in there. Uh, part of that material that I wrote, and the book is available if anybody's interested in it, was on this particular subject, humanism. And the reason I brought this to our attention this morning, and we'll hopefully kind of go through a little bit of our discussion this morning, is to begin to realize just how much this philosophy of humanism has indeed affected our thinking uh, or society's thinking. Uh, and it is astounding sometimes as I hear statements from politicians and other leaders around the world just how much they believe the material that is in this particular handout that you've gotten. Humanism by far is nothing new. Uh, as you can read there at the beginning of your first page, the word humanism was coined by Friedrich Nykheimer. Did I say that right, Josh? I'm not sure either? Okay. Close enough at the beginning of the 19th century and we used to refer to classical literature. He believed that a sense of civics and civility were vital in a child's education and made efforts to combine the best philanthropism with the best of humanism, a word that he derived from Sibirio's humanistus. A part of this thinking is the idea that man is supreme and doesn't need God. Is that shocking? To think that somehow or another we as human beings could get to the point to where we believe we are supreme and that we don't need God. That is probably one of the key beliefs of humanism that you will see in the teachings and in what you hear from some political movements. Going on with the reading, it says, the humanist movement as an organization has been around since the mid 18th century and was formalized around 1940. It seems that much of the points were focused on how the old churches that came after the apostasy and before the restoration were dominating society and oppressing the government. So if we take a look at that sentence for just a minute, what do you suppose, and I don't know whether we have a traveling mic yet, I, that's my fault, I didn't suggest that. So um, what do you suppose he meant by old churches? We're just trying to help set the stage here just a little bit. Anybody have her hand up for that one? We do have a mic. What do we mean by old churches? Remember when we are, we're in the 18th century. What church was probably dominant in that particular era around the world? Catholic, Catholic Church, okay. And you and I have seen movies about how Catholicism was a dominant religion of the day. Almost all political ideals, almost all political movements and those things that different regions about around the country tried to, to project towards its people came from where? The Catholic Church and probably Rome and there were more than one pope and there was one more, one, a 
I'll get that out yet, more than one center for the Catholic Church. But basically, they're looking at that old church. We also can look back to the 16th and 17th century and realize that the people of that particular era were not very well educated, and the church was also making claims, the church being the Catholic Church, that we are the church, the Unitarian movement of that, and that we have all thought, and you don't need to know anything other than what the church tells you. So that was somewhat this oppression that was taking place after the apostasy. What does the word apostasy mean? Who would like to share that one? A falling away, okay. When did the apostasy start according to church history, approximately? About 570, what happened in 570? Microphone. <laughs> I need to correct what I said. <clears throat> the apostasy did not start in 570. The apostasy was complete in 570. There you go. Um, according to the work Ben Madison did in investigating all that, by that point, um, all of the key markers he was looking for of following the gospel, such as baptism by immersion and some of those things, by about 570, near as we can tell from the records, none of that was still existent in any church that was claiming to be Christian. Sure. Thank you very much. So we see when did the apostasy may have, that was multiple questions in a lousy sentence. When do you think apostasy may have started, according to scriptures? Scriptures do talk about an apostasy that, apostasy that is to come. Okay. It started the day Christ ascended, and it was going to go downhill from then, as the people of the regions and so forth did not uh, fully embrace Christianity and began to teach falsehoods, and those falsehoods continue to dominate the church for a long time. Okay, that's a little brief history about apostasy. What do we mean by restoration? Okay, restoration like it was in the beginning. Uh, was there a, a restoration, so to speak, prior to the restoration that we might use? We use that term a little differently than I think perhaps those who study general Christianity history is. We have a word for it. It's called reformation. Reformation, okay, is maybe a better word. Because you take a look at... Uh, Calvin and Luther and some of the other men back in the 15th, 16th centuries that began to realize that this church that was dominating the world, and it was a very heavy domination of the world, was uh, oppressing the people so much that they couldn't think for themselves and a restoration needed to be taken place because they were definitely going down some wrong paths. Okay? Now, back to our words. Here in that third paragraph, it reads, It is also interesting to note that they call themselves a, and I put this in parentheses, a religion, which humanists do call themselves a religion. And one might wonder how they can use that term, for usually the term religion is defined as a belief in and worship of a supreme being. Humanism, what did that statement up above, the first yellow marked statement say? There is no God. Okay, we might as well keep a microphone up here with, he's, I know because of his class material at Blue Springs, he's got a little bit he's probably going to say, and I appreciate the fact that he's here with me. Um, <clears throat> okay then. Um, <laughs> it, it is worth noting um, the, the, the conception there of religion as being a belief in, and worship in a supreme being is primarily true of what we would consider Western religions. A lot of Eastern religions are more in line with humanism, and as the 19th century progressed and the West became more familiar with many Eastern philosophies, humanism has borrowed from them very heavily. Correct. Thank you. Okay. One of the secondary definitions of religion says that it is an adherence to a cultural system of design philosophy which it might fit. 
Now we get into some of the quotes that I have taken from this website, aboundingjoy.com, humanism, and where, it, where the quote is there. We live in a day when there is a great war going on in the society in which we live. There are many battlefronts and aspects to the war, but the primary war in our day is between Christianity and secular humanism. Do you understand that statement? Do you believe that statement? Do you see it happening? I see several heads being uh, nodding forward. What do you think we mean between a battle between Christianity and secular humanism? Kevin, you were shaking your head. Let's give the microphone to Kevin. It's clear to me as I've gotten older that the bumper sticker that says coexistence <laughs> yeah. is not the reality. Um, the reality of secular humanism is to destroy Christianity, period, and, and uh, any reference to God. Right. Because if we do not need God, we do not have to be responsive to God or responsible to him, and they don't want to be. That can be huge. Okay. Yes. Diana. Over the years, I have noticed uh, a big change in Sunday mornings. Uh, it used to be there was traffic, and you know, you had to leave pretty early so you could get there in time because of all the traffic of people that were going to church. <laughs> now, there's traffic going to ball games and traffic going to supermarkets and uh, malls. But when it's time to go to church, you know, early on Sunday morning, there's hardly anybody yeah, on the road. And, and you can look at the sanctuary and see that, too, where it used to be, you know, we were filled at capacity. Mm -hmm. there's, you can see a change in our communities. Very much be, so. Because of this. Not just in our communities, but in our community's way of thinking about things which is probably reflectant of, oh my gosh, I don't need God, therefore I don't need to go to church. Oh, I can go to the whatever, the park, the park picnic. picnic, all kinds of different alternative <laughs> activities. I am especially concerned about not just the activities like Diana is suggesting here, but also about the thinking patterns of the two different philosophies the battle between Christianity and how we think and what, who we want to be responsive to and who the world, the rest of the world does not. Josh has got his hand up again. I told you to keep that microphone over there closed. You should have seen this coming. You and I talked about some of this <laughs> stuff a lot at the Aaronic Assembly. I did see it coming. Um, <clears throat> so as we talked about somewhat at length at the Aaronic Assembly, people come from different frames of reference in terms of how they reach the conclusions they do. And there is some truth that for some people it's a, I don't need God, but we also need to keep in mind that in our society, you don't have to look further than politics and, and what people try to beat each other over the head with, there has been a lot of emphasis placed on the value and the authority of modern science, which is not equipped to say anything about God and has been often erroneously used to make the claim that God is not something that exists. And many people who are not very well versed in philosophy, I remember hearing uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and somebody else both saying that they th both scientists both saying that they didn't see any need for philosophy in today's day and age. Um, they are taken in by these arguments that God doesn't exist. Well, once you have accepted the position that God is something that does not exist, then when you go and you look at a religion such as Christianity, well, what is our standpoint? We believe these things because God says these things. But if your conclusion is God doesn't exist, then this is nothing more than something a collection of men many, 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 many years ago claimed. And so we've got to go start over. We've got to come up 
with some sort of new core philosophy. As we get into this table and the things they believe, you're going to see that in how they come to their conclusions because they are starting from that initial position that God isn't something that exists. Correct. There was something that went through my mind while Josh was speaking, and now it's f flew away. <laughs> that ever happened to the rest of us? Okay, Sherry's got, maybe I'll remember while Sherry's. Something that Raymond and I have talked a lot about recently, well, quite a while now, is that this battle is going on in the world where right has become wrong and wrong has become right. And th there's just that battle yeah. of that. And we hate to say it, but even our own sons kind of get in that battle yeah. where they think some things that are we consider wrong are right now. Right, and that's part of that. Uh, humanistic philosophy kind of creeping into their education and consequently changing their mind. It's happening to all of our children who may be in that 20, 25, 30 year old age bracket. The other thing, that the th and while Sherry was talking, I did remember what I was thinking about. One of the other things that humanism would love, or the people who buy into that, would love to do is to destroy Christianity. We are no longer needed. We are a antiquated way of thinking, and we should do away with churches. Albert. We've had this coming on for a lot of years because I remember when I was much younger, uh, you better fill your gas tank up on Saturday because everything was closed on Sundays. <laughs> People didn't go and buy groceries on Sundays. Uh, people didn't play sports on Sundays, their children involved in soccer and softball and basketball. And uh, we have all been participants in that. It is more enticing with this new wave of uh, humanism uh, than, than re religion. And uh, so how many of us have gone shopping on, on Sunday? Uh, because it's a convenient day, you're not working, and and uh, it's it's taken away our our worship of the Lord uh, for His day. Yeah. Uh, Coral and I, uh, we used to drive from uh, out in the country into the uh, to the city to go to church on Sunday morning. There was a uh, flea market that we drove by every Sunday. There were hundreds of cars lined up along the road going into a flea market and we go to the church and you know we might have 40 or 50 cars but it didn't look anything like this the flea market let alone as the uh, gambling uh, casinos got started uh, their their parking lots full day and night yeah. uh, just you know throughout the months yeah. uh, there's no downtime for them so that's going around every day and people are enticed by that and when you talk to them about the Lord, they don't want to give that up. Uh, it's a lot easier if you never indulge in that. Right. But uh, there again, we still all have somewhat been guilty of not honoring the Lord's day. And uh, we've certainly paid a price for it. Yeah. And, you know, along with that, I think what somewhat what Albert is saying here is that uh, people no longer want to be, and I made that statement earlier, responsible to God. You know, we have a certain set of moral standards that we try to adhere to, but those who are around us would love to do away with that standard so that they can do whatever they want to do in a lot of different realms. And that's causing that severe decline. Josh, and then we need to get to our chart. A <laughs> little bit of a <clears throat> tinfoil hat moment, but you'll notice, and you've already alluded to it, and you listen to a lot of politicians talk, they very much embody and support the ideals that we're about to go through here in this chart. And it's interesting, while we're talking a lot in this chart as we get into it, that man is, is the highest being, 
among men what is the highest thing. If there is no God that we answer to, the highest thing we answer to becomes government. I find it very interesting that most of your politicians will espouse humanist ideals because it puts the organization that they have their hands in and the reins of power as the ultimate power among mankind. And that same government in most Western countries is in control of the education system and other things like that. And these ideas that ultimately shore up the power of certain individuals continue to get propagated throughout our societies. Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we got about 20 minutes here. See if we can get, we probably won't get through all of this, 20 minutes. This chart was put together by um, somewhere I had it indicated here by someone other than me. Let's put it that way for the moment. Um, it's something that I pulled off of the humanist website. First topic, God. Humanists usually do not believe that God even exists. Humanists believe mankind is the highest entity. Man is the measure of all things. That kind of gets to what Josh was saying. And they want to be in total control, and they will have control of education, and etc. And therefore, they can promote this philosophy, and they can begin to change our minds to make us think that mankind is in charge. Number two, God's name. Uses God's name as a byword. God's name means nothing to the humanist because he does not believe God exists. How many times do we hear the word, the, uh, God's name used in profane ways? And it's becoming more and more common, is it not, in media today and in other places. Uh, I worked in a, before I started coming into the church office every day, in a place where the employees of the company that I was working for were usually just untrained people. We didn't need to hire educated for a specific purpose kind of people. Do you understand what I'm saying? With it? So consequently their language was extremely rough. And I couldn't repeat their language here because we would find it offensive. But that was their normal everyday sentence. And that word God was in their sentences often. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, if he existed at all, was a mere man. He may have been an interesting teacher, but when he died, he, he stayed dead like any other man. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, it's not true. <laughs> okay. Now, that, that's important. Did that microphone leave, Josh? At Blue Springs, we've been going through the Restoration Faith, and I would encourage anyone who has not reread through that recently to do so, because it is very behooven on us to know what we believe. Because along with this idea that Jesus was nothing more than a man, there is very heavily the idea out there and the criticism of religious people that if Jesus were around today, he would reject most Christians because they don't actually follow. Now, sometimes they have legitimate points in terms of how Christian individuals are behaving, but many times they also heavily manipulate and distort their characterization of what Christ actually taught in order to try and undermine an otherwise uninformed person's belief of the value of Christian doctrine. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions there in the third column have also been rather interesting. I don't know whether you've had a chance to maybe glance over to that column, but uh, the question here is, have I personally received the Lord Jesus Christ into my life? Am I living for him and worshiping him as Savior and Lord, or do I basically ignore him as a humanist would do? What's the problem with ignoring Jesus Christ? He's the Lord. He's the Lord. Okay. He's the door. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. 
Now, I, I understand also, and this is not a Latter-day Saint chart, uh, I understand also, and as you look at missionary statements that are made by other denominations sometimes, uh, the Lord, all they have to do is accept Jesus Christ and say that they accept or believe in Jesus Christ and thus they are saved. I'm not going to go down that path this morning, but that is also a, a concern. Uh, and the way that that particular statement was made, said there, that I have received the Lord Jesus Christ into my life. Well, yes, I receive him, but as is mentioned by this morning by Brother Tim's, it's also a matter of enduring and changing and becoming what God wants you to become. We are on a pathway to become people who are ready for the celestial kingdom. So it's more than just accepting or receiving the Lord. Just want to kind of bounce that out there just a little bit. Uh, the next thing then down there is creation. Uh, humanist acts and talks as if evolution is a scientific fact and that anyone who disagrees is ignorant. Now, I know you probably haven't received your new Hastings Times yet. Anybody received it? Wow, because I think we just mailed it on Thursday afternoon. <laughs> right in the very center of the Hastings Times for this edition is an article written by yours truly on evolution. I'm not trying to get you to read the article necessarily. <laughs> but it does bring up some interesting points. Along the side note with this, I have been reading some textbooks called the Universal Model that are about 800 pages each, and there's three of them, that talk about different aspects of science and how many of the theories that we are being taught in our public schools and here on the media are just that. They are theories. The problem is oftentimes they're not presented to you as theories, they're presented to you as fact. And they, if you really look at those pseudo theories, is what the textbook calls them, you begin to realize that uh, we're being taught some falsehoods that are distorting what we ought to be believing in. One of the major goals of these textbooks that I've been reading is to give us validation that the flood could really have happened. And I happened to get a CD Thursday that I ordered and bought that was put out by a Presbyterian man who also is a proponent of the idea that the flood could really have happened and explains a little bit about how that could, have, could be. Now, why is that important? Why do we need to look at Genesis as being history rather than Genesis as being a myth? Well, not just the feasibility of the ark, but Kevin? Creation that we're, creation that we're created beings that were created by God rather than by pond scum. Exactly. Evolution would teach us that we come from pond scum. <laughs> and all of the, and this is another one of those things that we could probably do a doctoral thesis on, all of the ramifications that come along with that, in other words, God did not create us and we have no one that we need to be responsible to. Because man is. 30 seconds? Uh, I could go on this one a really long time, and you know that. We, I know that. We, we've already talked I about said, 30 seconds. I, I, will, I will remind everyone, going back to something that I said earlier, a lot of how this gets applied in arguments of religion is a misattribution of what science says. Mm -hmm. Because the problem evolution has is it's assumed that if everything came from pond scum that's where we started and not God. But the answer isn't where did the pond scum come from <laughs> and, that, and those sorts of things. So you, you, we have the problem of people who want to knock down religion 
are using science to say things that science isn't equipped to say in the first place. Or has they, I said that wrong, or, nor have they validated through proper testing procedures to prove that the scientific theories they're proponing, did I say that word right? That they're a proponent of are true. We do need to be a little careful about that and how we talk about it because in the scientific setting a theory is something that has been set up as we believe this is what's happened, this is the evidence that supports it and as far as anybody who is supporting evolution is concerned if you're talking to them they're going to say this is fact because this is the best characterization of our understanding that we have and in some cases they are right about that, that this is as best we understand it, but there's two problems. A, the limitations of human understanding, mm -hmm. and even within the circles that are proponents of evolution, one of the things to be aware of is not everybody agrees within the scientific community of the various mechanics by which it happens. And there is a strange degree of shutting down alternative ideas, even if they're not God-oriented ideas. And I think it's very much out of a fear that, well, if we stray too far from what we've already said right now, this undermines our replacement for the need of God. Yes. And it also may uh, eliminate my job. Because, <laughs> because if I am a scientific thinker, and I come up with a new idea about how things might be and even could validate that new idea, I could be drummed out of my college professorship because I'm not in alignment with everybody else. So all I'm really saying is here is that we need to be careful with what we're being told to see whether or not what we're being told is true and where it comes from. Now that's not to say that the scientific uh, world of engineering, which is very precise, and ca even perhaps chemistry, I'm not trying to say that all the things that are talked to us in engineering, Dave, if we're building a bridge, there's certain principles that we have to have to build that bridge, and those are pretty well set, right? Right. right. Let me just stress test and so forth that take place in the steel and the materials and so forth that are there. That science, I'm okay with. Just ask Jack. Just ask Jack. Is Jack here? There he is. Hi, Jack. I need to get my glasses fixed. <laughs> okay. Now, let's go on. We've, we're, I know we're not going to get through this. The Bible. Humanists consider the Bible of little interest. Believes the Bible to be the work of men, perhaps with a religious ox to grind, axe to grind. Ox. What'd you say? That might have been correct. Yeah, maybe that's true. Surly does not accept it as the word of God. So what is their moral standard? Human happiness. Human happiness. Oh, okay. I was going to say nothing, but that's probably true. Whatever makes me happy is right. Which <laughs> Okay. Self-esteem. A humanist sees man as basically good. Do we see man as basically good? Kevin Romer. Natural man cannot understand the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Okay. So we have a little different view. And one of the statements you make around the office frequently to us is, who is the source of all goodness? God is the source of all goodness. I should not really be giving me, me credit. I need to give God credit for all goodness. Okay. How about the sanctity of life? Since man is a merely highly evolved animal, some human life is not so special. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? How has that crept into some of the things that are being done in the world? What human life is not special? <laughs> a 
Josh had his hand up. I was trying to. It's worth noting how insanely selectively applied this particular factor is. Because if you go and you look at, for example, discussions on capital punishment and whether or not certain <coughs> actions by people should merit a death penalty, you will see humanist philosophy very much pushing an idea that all life is special and precious and there is never any justification for taking it. But somehow all of that goes out the window when you come to a subject like abortion and they start contorting themselves into all kinds of weird pretzels in order to say that that's not life. Or they'll admit that it is life but it gets back to that human happiness. It's a life that is standing in the way of the mother getting a job or whatever else and therefore it's justification that it can be taken. Okay, it goes on. Uh, Corwin? We got about five minutes before I promised them I would quit. Oh, I was enjoying this. I enjoy it <laughs> better than the next guy. Um, <laughs> oh, that's because you're the next guy? The thought that came to my mind when you asked that question was the, the second story in the scriptures after Adam and Eve about Cain and Abel. And God's response, and this just gets back to the issue of whether they even recognize that there is a God or they just worship themselves, which is their problem, um, that Cain and Abel really sets the tone for God's interaction with man is that we don't have the right to take another person's life. That is God's choice. Now, he does qualify that within the scriptures of those who have committed that crime and have committed certain crimes cannot be trusted in society to not create more havoc and have to re be removed from society. And so we have developed prisons and such for that, but there are those crimes that are no redemption from. And psychologically, you can't come back from, because when you're willing to cross that line, it creates a problem. Yeah. And I'm not talking about warfare, I'm talking about murder. Yeah. If I consider all men of worth to God, then I should respect all men and try to help them in every way that I can to draw nearer to him as a part of my ministry throughout life. Well, like I said, we're running out of time very quickly, and I knew we would. So if you go ahead and go down that row, uh, there's conversation there about sin, there's conversation about goals, sex, deviancy, moral relativeness, Tolerance, which is a really interesting one to consider, and family. And there's a big, long uh, description of what they believe about family. The last page. There in the blue, it says, The humanist view is trying to take away from any mention of God in our conversations, education, and government. That creates an atmosphere where humanists no longer have to strive to be good by any standard or other than the individual and collective man-based viewpoint. In other words, man desires to become God. Not only collectively should we speak about man, but almost every individual becomes a God to themselves. How dangerous is that? How prophetic was that? when it was mentioned in the scriptures. Humanism tells us that man is at least at last becoming aware that he alone is responsible for the realization of the worlds of his dreams, that he alone is within himself the power for its achievement. Now I would encourage you to take these sheets that I have given you, look at them, contemplate them, maybe stick them in the back of your mind a little bit and see when you listen to the news on Sunday nights and Sunday mornings and any other day of the week whether or not you're hearing some of these humanistic views coming into the thoughts that are being shared or promoted by those who are trying to control our world. Christianity is in trouble a great deal because humanism is fighting against us even, like I said, so much that it wishes to destroy us. 
and we need to be ready to be able to rebuke that. Shirley, I wish I could hear what you have to say, but I promised them 10:20 I'd be done, and that's where we're at. So, thank you. <laughs>